These birds have a destiny. They are Nicholas Pedigree Poults, curiously examining their first day of life. In their genes is a wonderful story of efforts and dreams fulfilled that reaches back for over 50 years. Their destiny is to help to feed a hungry world, spearhead a growing industry, and join the thousands of select stock that populate Nicholas Farms from Europe to the shores of the Pacific Ocean. Today, in 1989, some will cross San Francisco's beautiful Golden Gate Bridge, traveling between the many California farms to the north and the south of its span. But in 1937, the bridge was brand new. Then, an excited parade of humanity flooded the Golden Gate from one end to the other, celebrating its completion. At the very same time, in a serene country valley, just to the north, George Nicholas was quietly setting up his first breeding pens. By then, he'd met his lifelong companion, Johnny, and they would soon buy their first farm. They didn't know it at the time, but this was the beginning of a grand adventure that would reach around the world and touch the lives of many people. Born in San Francisco in 1916, George's family soon moved north, near a small but proud agricultural community that hailed itself, at the time, as the egg basket of the world, Petaluma, California. It was a fine place to grow up for a boy who loved to tend animals, and George surrounded himself with all kinds. One, in particular, seemed to capture his fancy, and he later remarked, why anyone would sell pigeons to buy two feeder pigs, and then in turn sell the two pigs to buy one bred turkey hen, I will never quite understand. Nevertheless, I did just that in the fateful year of 1931. A fateful year, George called it, for he was destined to build a life around difficult, visionary decisions regarding turkeys. He never said what happened to that first hen, but his imagination was fired, and the profits from his animals helped him to pursue his interests at the University of California at Davis. There, George attracted the attention of a professor who shared his special interest in turkeys, Dr. V.S. Mindy Asmundson. And Dr. Asmundson became George's good friend and advisor the relationship was to last a lifetime. After the university, George wasted little time in getting on with his life. He had his education, he had a resolve to do something special with his knowledge, and he had an uncanny ability to make the right decisions at the right time. So, in 1938, he married Aline Johnson. In Johnny, as she was known to everyone, George found the person he would count on to work as hard as he would for the future. And in 1939, they bought a lovely farm in the Valley of the Moon to breed their birds. Here, in Weinberg, as it is still called, Nicholas Turkey Breeding Farms was born. However, many years before, near the turn of the century, events had already taken place in distant England that would help set the stage for George and Johnny's future. Then, Lord Rothschild, a wealthy English landowner, was constantly seeking new delicacies to delight his friends and dinner guests. Among his discoveries was the American turkey. He'd hunted on the land of a farmer named Jesse Throssell and found that this man could deliver broad-breasted samples of this bird to his table, and he paid handsomely for them. Since there was good money to be made, Jesse went to extra effort to breed his turkeys for their meat, not their feather patterns. In this, his birds showed a marked difference from their American cousins who were lean and bred mainly for their looks. By the time Throssell moved to Canada in the late 1920s, he certainly thought enough of his birds to take them with him. He had been selecting the widest and heaviest birds from his flocks for over 20 years, and by the 1930s, they attracted attention in shows from as far away as Oregon, where they were imported into the flocks of two well-known breeders, Ward Cochran and Max Lyons. These men were still carrying on Jesse Throssell's work, breeding their birds for body weight and broad breast, when in the spring of 1940, George Nicholas made a trip to Oregon to buy some 600 of their mature birds to bring to his farm in Sonoma. After George visited the Oakland, Oregon Turkey Show, he knew that the days of the standard bred browns were probably numbered. So we decided to purchase adult birds of the broad-breasted brown variety to bring to Sonoma. We had every hope that these birds would be the beginning of the Nicholas strain. After the purchase of the Oregon birds, the Nicholas gene pool would be closed for many years. George had set a genetic course to synthesize his own distinct strain of birds, and by 1945, he had established his goals and was ready for a basic progeny testing program. 
He decided that these standards would cover a broad range of genetic traits and produce birds that would gain acceptance by the hatchery men, the growers, the processors, and certainly the consumers. This meant broad, heavy turkeys with good conformation. He wasn't raising show birds. The feathers were a beautiful bronze, but early on, George suspected that this needed to change as well. However, at this time, it was important to steadily expand and improve his broad-breasted bronze flocks while gaining recognition as a breeder. Typically, he seemed to have an interest in everything to do with the industry. In 1947, he was a member of the first California Turkey Breeding Advisory Board, and by 1949, he was conducting nutritional research with Dr. Howard Kratzer and Hope Halloran. Business continued to expand as advances were made on all fronts. In 1950, the first Nicholas Hatchery was built to accommodate the growing pedigree flocks. It was also at this time that O.P. Sass Sephoris joined Nicholas. He remained for many years as production manager. The following year, George joined with Walter Crawford and Don Gordon to form C&G Breeders, an egg agency to distribute Nicholas product. The orders, while not exactly a flood, were enough to help expand research and production. CNG breeders have advised that they can ship up to 4,000 turkey eggs to our Detroit Lakes, Minnesota dairy and poultry Dear plant George, on May 7th. Receive your letter we regarding like the possibilities and advantages of an egg sales hatchery operated here in Texas by Western Hatcheries. We too feel there are tremendous possibilities in a program of this nature. As These you know, orders George, expressed early confidence in the Nicholas breeding program, and some were also a reflection of others' hopes and dreams I'm for their future. A grower in Western Ontario. I eventually wish to start my own hatchery and am writing you to make inquiries about foundation eggs. My wish is to carry on pedigree work. George always had a firm belief that what is good for the industry is good for Nicholas Turkey Breeding Farms. In fact, by 1953, he had gained quite a reputation and many people were very interested in what he had to say. As you know, George always had his own ideas about where the turkey industry should be going. But he always wanted to know what other people's needs were before he made up his mind. So when we added on to the other house at Feinberg, George and I decided it would be a good thing if we brought some customers and industry people together to talk things over. The first time we had four, four people and they all slept in the house. When it got up to 125 people, we finally had to hold the conferences elsewhere. I remember one year, I believe it was, oh, 1953, 54, they even did a radio broadcast during the meetings and interviewed us and most of our guests. That lady certainly enjoyed the view. I only of the wish all of you could be here with me to see this beautiful panoramic view. We are uh, having a grand time here at the Nicholas home here in the Valley of the Moon. We're standing in their lovely patio with a panoramic view from the pa uh, patio window here looking out over lovely Sonoma Valley. We can see Mount Tamil Pius and all of this wonderful countryside around here. It's really terrific. I really wish you were here. Now, George, uh, I would like to know, we, we hear a lot about the Nicholas Turkey Program. What, uh, what, is your am what are your ambitions? What will the end result of this Nicholas Turkey Program be? Well, the, the end result is a desire on our part to provide the uh, turkey producing people with a more economical product, that one that can convert feed more economically to meat and consequently pass on a, a price saving to the ultimate consumer. How many turkeys do you raise here on this range? Well, we, we raise only about 15,000 birds. Fifty, oh, about the only 15,000. Oh. Uh, the free exchange of information and ideas has been a cornerstone of Nicholas Turkey Breeding Farm since its founding. These early conferences encouraged customers to share their problems and probe for solutions that would benefit everyone. Discussions were heated at times. After all, the men and women who gathered here were often competitors, and sometimes they brought with them conflicting needs and expectations. But the value of the meetings was undeniable from the start. Today, after 36 years, they reach back in an unbroken chain. By 1954, several people had joined the Nicholas staff. Good people were as important as well-bred turkeys. He needed people who would bring new knowledge and talents to the operation and help carry on with the future. On the urging of Dr. Asmundson, Nicholas added a young scientist to the staff as a consulting geneticist. 
Dr. Fred Schultz. Immediately afterwards, Nicholas established the Oak Hills Research Farm, which was to become the home of the Nicholas Gene Pool and the site for testing the various strain crosses. Dr. Schultz was there from the very beginning. One of the things that really impressed me, George and Johnny stated that they had reached the point where they could capitalize on what they had done and rake in the money for the next few years without any further expanded expenditures. Instead, they had decided that they wanted to progress, they wanted to grow, and they saw in the turkey and the turkey industry a tremendous future. Some 30 years ago, this little valley behind me was covered with bronze and white turkeys. One of the first things that George Nicholas did after he hired me was to go out and buy this farm. The second thing he did was to hire Jack Merritt to run the farm. So we set up pens that each one held 100 turkeys, and they lined both sides of this little road. And in these pens, we tested many different strains that we imported. We made crosses between these strains in order to develop new synthetic lines. One of my first duties was to accompany George over to Don Gordon's hatchery in Merced to observe the pulling of the first Nicholas White Pulse. Before I arrived on the scene, George had already made his first steps in the development of the Nicholas White. Now this was a big gamble, and for a small breeder such as George was at that time, this was a gigantic undertaking. He top selected a large group of what was called the Lancaster White Toms, a big, fast growing, raw bone turkey. And George went through and pulled off the very biggest Toms, selected only for growth rate brought these toms back and mated them to a select group of his bronze hens. He took the first cross, which was of course all bronze, mated them back to his own strain of uh, bronze. We got the second, uh, the back cross, and then mated these birds inter se. Out of that, you would expect six and a quarter percent white poles. And it was quite, uh, interesting to me to look down into this hatching tray, see all these little brown poults running around, and in among them an occasional white poult. And to see that segregation, which was exactly what was predicted, uh, kind of made you believe that there's something to this genetic business after all. Of course, there really was something to this genetic business, and it began to hit full stride at Oak Hills. This new endeavor marked the establishment of a genetics department within the company. From this time on, growth in the company was constant on all fronts. Scientific research continued at Oak Hills when new experimental houses were constructed. These would test the theory that birds could be brought into production in the off-season. New knowledge and techniques were shared with the industry whenever possible. It was also in 1958 that the first Nicholas Turkey News appeared. Originally published as a forum for new developments, the news later proved to be an important instrument in the intensive federal market order debates of the 1960s. If 1931 was a fateful year, 1959 was certainly its offspring. Intensive genetic selection had successfully been carried out, providing large, white birds with the broad appeal that George had envisioned. Now, it was time to introduce the Nicholas White to the commercial world. This was a milestone for Nicholas and the industry, for it was the start of the transition from traditional bronze to the white turkey. Within five short years, the transition would be complete. The whites would not only prove valuable to the company, but the increased popularity of these birds would help stimulate world expansion of the industry. The gamble was going to pay off for everyone. In fact, I think we were surprised that we did it so quickly. But uh, that processing pressure was very strong, and the processors 
wanted that white turkey from the moment it came out. So that, that was where we made a decision that the total pedigree program should go on the white. We foresaw the end of the bronze turkey as a commercial widespread entity. The introduction of the new white cross was full of promise and it seemed to launch the 60s as a decade full of activity and progress for the company. New scientific programs, increased production, and additional facilities followed year after year. In 1960, Nicholas introduced the Dave Cooper strain into its breeding program by purchasing Cooper's facilities and flocks in Roseburg, Oregon. The Cooper bird was well known as a large, broad-breasted turkey that had won many dressed bird shows in the past. This new strain was a remarkable addition to the Nicholas genetics program and later became the male line of the popular Nicholas two-way cross. This two-way cross was yet another milestone in a genetics program that was definitely proving itself in the marketplace. In 1960, Toms weighed 28 pounds at 26 weeks. Today, of course, we expect those same weights in just 17 short weeks. But that kind of performance would come only after many more years of constant selection, using first the two-way cross and later the modern three-way cross. After the Cooper purchase, the company continued to expand its gene pool and facilities throughout the 60s. A pedigree hatchery capable of setting 46,000 eggs a week was built in Sonoma to serve the female line and the mini Nicholas flock owners. George once thought that if he sold 40,000 eggs in one year, the business would be as large as he could expect. The company began reaching overseas early in the decade when Nicholas helped to organize British United Turkeys, working with several well-known British breeders. Nicholas was then able to bolster the British gene pool with breeding stock free of disease. It was in 1965 that the veterinary department was established and a full-time veterinarian was added to the staff, Dr. Richard McCapes. Another important purchase was made in 1967 when Nicholas acquired the turkey division of Kimber Farms, Niles, California. Kimber, an old egg strain breeding organization, had branched out into turkey breeding several years before. Although this purchase provided Nicholas with additional lines for its gene pool, it turned out that the more important aspect of this purchase was the acquisition of a substantial number of Kimber customers. Two Kimber employees came along with the turkeys, Larry Pickering and Dr. George Farnsworth. A department of avian physiology was established in 1968 when Dr. Frank Cherms joined the Nicholas staff. New studies dealing with fertility, hatchability, and frozen semen were soon underway. Over the years, other important lines have been purchased and added to the gene pool. An important male line purchased from Jerome is an example. During the 70s, Nicholas continued to grow. By 1970, sufficient test cross work had been conducted to bring the Nicholas three-way cross onto the market. In 1983, George Nicholas, by now retired from the company, was recognized for his contributions to the entire turkey industry when he was elected to the Poultry Hall of Fame by the American Poultry Historical Society. The U.S. Agriculture
and perhaps allow us an opportunity to consult with you and determine truly your needs. It's a great industry. There's a great bunch of people. It's a great honor to have been inducted into the Hall of Fame. And I can only thank you for being such an attentive audience. Nicholas was certainly the guiding hand of Nicholas Turkey Breeding Farms for over 40 years. His dedication and vision helped form a strong foundation for the Nicholas of today. Nicholas is the largest turkey breeding organization in the world. The Nicholas pedigree and grandparent flocks are distributed among 37 farms in California and Scotland. Today, Nicholas has over 500 skilled employees and most of these people care for the hundreds of thousands of pedigree and grandparent birds required to obtain the millions of parent stock eggs needed by our customers. Today, our close working relationship with these customers continues to be an important part of the Nicholas business philosophy. One of the great advantages of the Nicholas program has always been the network of able people who share their thoughts with us. This is critical to our success because no one person or group can have all the good ideas or can accurately predict the demands of the market three to five years from now. For example, over 50% of the breeder manual has been changed since we put out the first one only 10 years ago. These changes came about because our people tried new things and benefited from the trials of others. Yes, many changes have taken place in the last 50 years. In 1945, the breeding program was increased to 180 hens made it on a single sire basis with 15 tongs. Today, we have well over 7,500 highly selected hens mated with almost 1,000 choice tongs. From these matings, plus a few gene pool matings, we wing band approximately 200,000 poults each year. In 1979, Nicholas became an important part of the largest poultry breeding organization in the world. It was in that year that Nicholas and Arbor Acres were combined. This relationship has helped Nicholas acquire many new facilities. In addition to the new farms recently built, we have spent a very considerable sum to provide maximum protection on all farms in order to deliver to our customers breeding stock as free of disease as is practical. Not only have we placed chain-link fences topped with barbed wire around all our farms, we've also placed guard dogs on many farms. we found that trained dogs released within the enclosure each evening discourages even the most persistent intruders. There is no exchange of equipment or personnel between farms. Every person must thoroughly shower upon either entering or leaving a farm. Nicholas was one of the first to eliminate Mycoplasma meleagridus and Arizona paracolon. Today, Nicholas continues to make every effort to control and reduce egg transmitted diseases.
A European division, Nicholas Europa, has been established in Ayrshire, Scotland to produce parent stock from within the European economic community. Since 1988, all the Nicholas breeding stock sold in Europe has been produced on their five farms. Colts from the pedigree pens in California are shipped to Scotland several times a year to make sure the genetic quality of Nicholas parent stock meets the same high standards worldwide. Scotland also serves as one of the several genetic reserve locations for our pedigree strains. These facilities are all located in the lush, green, rolling countryside southwest of Glasgow. As always, the heart of the Nicholas research effort is the selection, year after year, of the best families and the very best individuals within these families for each of the male and female lines. Great care is taken to assure that many hundreds of thousands of important pieces of information are carefully and accurately recorded. There have been many checks along the way to make sure that eggs have been properly weighed recorded and sorted by dam so we are assured that each group of full siblings has been maintained as a single family and can be banded together. These poults are a very select group. Before the female line eggs are set, the geneticist will have once again examined the records for each dam, each dam's sisters, and each sire's sisters to determine whether the family still meet the standards of reproductive performance set for his selections. As the birds grow, data are collected on every tom and hen, whether it is kept or not. Information is obtained on body weight, conformation, and the condition of the legs, as well as how the birds stand. Certain families will be eliminated by the geneticist and certain individuals will be eliminated by the selectors. Only the best birds from the best families are permitted to produce offspring. Recently, the male line pedigree program was doubled in size and grandparent production was also increased substantially. The male line breeders have been given more isolation by providing greater separation between the male line farms. Now, one half of the male line pedigree program is located at Terza, while the other half is located at Dillon Beach. Steps have also been taken to make sure Nicholas customers receive genetic improvements as soon as possible. Although weights and scores are obtained several times for the male line, flocks are now grown to an even older age unselected to provide us a better measurement of family livability and the condition of the legs. Families are being selected for better stance and a superior gait. 25. 2270. 41.7. 41, These selections will make commercial toms easier to raise in the future. At the same time, selections will continue to provide a commercial bird that is capable of growing faster to a heavier weight with a higher percentage of white meat, all with an even better feed conversion. It has been the policy of Nicholas from the beginning to invest a substantial portion of the income per egg in genetic as well as other research efforts. This policy is very much a part of today's Nicholas, just as it was when the company was founded. Many years ago, George Nicholas established basic principles which Nicholas still follows today. People and facilities are the two elements that fuel a sound breeding program and proper reinvestment of earnings is the only way to guarantee the future. In this decade, Nicholas has been transformed from a company relying largely on contract egg production to the point today where 80% of eggs produced come from company farms. Expansion of the production system and our heavy investment in biosecurity programs and facilities has required a massive financial commitment from our parent company. In fact, Investment in production and research facilities has exceeded net income plus depreciation every year since being acquired by Arbor Acres. Today, Nicholas has the experienced, qualified people to ensure genetic progress. Our fine facilities will help ensure the reliable delivery of quality product in the future. 
We are listening to our customers' needs and are translating these needs into steady genetic progress, just as we have done for the last 50 years.